church. Now, you might think, well, what kind of problems could they possibly be having in the 1880s in a church? Well, it's the same problems we have, frankly. <laughs> same problems. You know what they were arguing about? It might be amazing to you that people would actually argue about that. We argue about the color of the carpet. That's what we argue about, right? You know what they argued about? They were arguing about the length of a communion towel. <laughs> I'm not making that up. <laughs> They were arguing about the length of a communion towel because some of them were reading in John chapter 13 and it said Jesus girded himself with that towel, which means he wrapped it around himself. And so if the towel is not long enough for you to gird yourself, then it's not appropriate for a communion service. Can you imagine people arguing about that? They were arguing about that. Today we're going to have a communion service with very short towels, <laughs> disposable wet wipes. I hope it doesn't offend you. I really do. I don't want to offend anybody. We're just trying to find a practical way to do this so that we can serve one another in humility, minister to one another. So that's what we're going to do. But let's pray together as we begin here today. Father, I'm thankful that you're the God who has demonstrated goodness to us, that you meet us where we are, and that you give us, Father, what we need to become more and more like you. I pray, Lord, as we open up scripture for a few minutes and as we enter into this time together of service and enjoying each other's presence in the midst of your presence, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and that you would give us power today to be true believers in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you have a Bible with you today. In the... Um, it's an interesting thing that we find in John chapter 15. We're going to revisit this next week a bit. It's one of those I am statements. The seventh one actually is in this chapter. Uh, we're going to jump to actually to verse 12. And uh, I want to read a few verses with you in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. Jesus says, this is my commandment. Now I've got a new King James version. Yours might read a little different. That's okay. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. <laughs> well, tough verse, if you're honest. That you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus goes on to say, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You're my friends. If you do whatever I command you, I no longer call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I call you friends, for all things that I heard from my father, I've made known to you. You didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. It's an ironic thing, I must say, that, that many times commandment-keeping people can be some of the most unloving people you'll meet. And in being unloving people, we are violating the core of the commandments. You can't be hateful and keep the commandments. The time we're in right now is challenging. I, I say that because it's, my, my son used to tell me, he says, Dad, you have an interesting way of stating the obvious. <laughs> but these are challenging times. They just simply are. People are at odds with one another. Good Christian men and women are at odds with one another over silly things like masks and COVID, over which 70-year-old white guy is going to be our next president? Difference of opinions on health care, whether or not there is such a thing as too much freedom. All these issues, and even in this church, and I'm not talking about the 20 million plus Seventh-day Adventists. I'm talking about even in this local church, there is a variety of opinion on every one of those issues. And it's okay. It's okay. As long as we treat each other with love, it's okay to have a variety of opinions. If you think 
that you're keeping the Ten Commandments and you're harboring hatred in your heart for someone who thinks differently than you, then you violated all ten of them. You're breaking the commandments. It was months ago I spoke about racial tensions in this country. And I discovered that racial tensions exist locally. I, I want you to know that I loathe politics. I loathe politics because politics, at least the way we're doing them right now here in the United States, all, they cause, all it causes is division. Amen. There's no unity there. Right. I, I spoke those months ago and I said three words that saw, caused some people, frankly, to lose their minds. I can be honest, right? Some of them are still upset at me, I guess. And I want to be really clear here about, about what I need to say this morning. I said Black Lives Matter. And I didn't mean it as a political statement, although many people took it that way, apparently. It wasn't an endorsement for any political group. It wasn't an endorsement even for that Black Lives Matter group. I said it as a way to bring attention to what was, and in many minds still is, a crisis our country is facing regarding relation, relational tensions of race that we're still dealing with. And I want to clarify this. Whatever your political opinion is, you have the right in this country to express it however you want to express it. Men have fought and died. Women have fought and died for you to have that freedom to your own opinion. But as a believer, you ought to express that opinion with love in your heart, with compassion on your lips. You need to do it differently than the unbelievers. As your pastor, I do everything I can to remain apolitical. So I want to apologize to any who might have been offended that what I said was political. It wasn't my intention. It never will be my intention to be political. And I hate, honestly, that it was taken that way. I can tell you this, however, that Anytime I see someone treated wrongly because of some random thing like skin color or eye color or their shoe size or the language they speak or how much they weigh, I'm going to stand in the gap for them. Because Jesus is a friend of the marginalized. And as a follower of Christ, I will do likewise. And you should too. Unity doesn't have to look like uniformity. What does that mean? As I say that sometimes, I think some people don't get it. It means that we can have a variety of opinion and still be loving. It means that we can have a variety of opinions and still all pull the same direction. Whether you vote for the Green Party or the Republican Party, or the Libertarian Party, or the Democratic Party, or whether you write someone's name in on the ballot for president, like Dr. Andy Rooney, make a great president, Andy. <laughs> no thanks? <laughs> Shirley Mooney. President, no? I'm looking for somebody. Sylvia, Guy, Ian, Joe? Whatever, however you vote for president, it's not going to change the way that I treat you. And however anybody else votes shouldn't change the way you treat them either. If you let political issues draw you away from kindness and you disrespect others or treat them with disdain or you make horrible comments about your fellow human beings who are also made in God's image or you threaten them with violence. I'll tell you, I've seen some heinous posts from believers on social media. You probably have too. If you do those things just because you don't agree with their political opinion, or what their opinion is regarding the use of a mask, or what their opinion is about COVID or abortion rights or gun control or whatever the issue happens to be, 
It's utter hypocrisy, by the way, for you to say you're pro-life on the one hand, and then you say on the other hand that if we would all be better off if so-and-so would just die already. You can't be pro-life and pro-death. But what you can be is civil and kind and compassionate and loving towards people who think differently than you do. At least that's what Jesus calls us to do. In John 15, verse 12, he says we need to love people. And I'll tell you, if there's one thing that Adventists pride themselves on, it's keeping the commandments. And we tell other people, we keep all ten of them. We don't skip the fourth one. Praise the Lord for that. But Jesus summarizes the root, the core, if you will, of all Ten Commandments. And he says it's love. Love. Obedience to the law looks like loving people. The commandment of Christ. It's a commandment to love like Christ loves. And unless and until you've experienced the grace of Christ and the forgiveness and love of Jesus, you won't be able to do that. It'll be impossible for you to love like Jesus if you don't know Jesus. If you're not connected with Jesus. Humility is required, not optional. There's no way you can be prideful and love other people like Jesus loves them. It's impossible. And humility can only be acquired from Jesus Christ himself. We're going to separate in a few minutes and, and we're going to do what we, we call the ordinance of humility. That's what we call it. And the reality of the service is The reality of the service is that we become Jesus for someone else. I don't know if you've ever wrestled with that piece of what we do. That when you're washing someone else's feet, you're Jesus for them. And then when you allow them to wash your feet, which is harder, isn't it? It's harder for us. They're being Jesus for you. And so, you can approach this, this service two different ways. It's something we're going to just do and, and be done with, and it's awkward and weird, and i got to touch someone's feet, okay? Or you can approach it like Jesus wants us to approach it, which is ministering to somebody with the care and respect of Jesus. That you would take the time to minister to them. That you would go the extra mile to care for them. Because that's what Jesus does for us. Jesus didn't have to wash those disciples' feet. He didn't have to do that. They'd already eaten, according to John. And supper was already over. They were just chilling. But Jesus is trying to teach his knucklehead disciples, like us, what it looks like to love like Jesus loves. And what's required is that we humble ourselves to one another and serve one another and treat each other better than you treat yourself. And if you take that attitude and if you take that approach to this ordinance of humility, the Lord will bless you. Let me pray for you. Father, I'm thankful that you are the God that Scripture declares you to be. Thankful, Lord, that you are consistent and steadfast. Thankful that you are the God who loves us even when we're unlovely. 
And I pray, Lord, that as we wash one another's feet, that you would, that you would perform a higher cleansing of our hearts, of our minds. That you forgive us of the times where we have been, frankly, not very kind people. That you would help us, Father, to, to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. That we might treat each other and treat those that we disagree with with kindness and compassion and respect. And yes, Father, with love. And so wash us. Clean us. That we might be whole in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.